Bob, do you want to take this slide then? Yeah, let's do this. Uh, okay, politics and the social system gain. So, you know, Wright says real societies are much more complex than represented in this model. The social system that constitutes a society is not a single integrated totality in which everything fits together under a unified set of rules. A society is not a system in the same way that an organism is a system. It is much more like the loosely coupled system of an ecosystem in which a variety of processes interact in relatively contingent ways. Multiple games are being played simultaneously, often with inconsistent rules. It is also not always clear how to draw the distinction between a change in the rules of the game and a change from one game to another. The accumulative effect of small changes in rules can alter the nature of the game to such an extent that eventually a new game is being played. You know, like how many, how many different reform, legal reforms to bird law can you pass before you're, you're playing an entirely different type of law, I guess. The idea of evolutionary socialism can be interpreted as a transformation of the inner nature of the game of capitalism by gradual changes in its rules, which is, which is just what was said, uh, like what you said just a, a slide or two ago. Right. And, and I guess uh, Tom's got the how that work out a little bit of sass going on. Didn't hasn't seemed to gone, go too good, I guess. So I guess my question is, how many changes can you make to bird law before eventually you're not doing bird law anymore? You're doing badger law. I well, it's an, inter it's an interesting of, question. Uh, this is the subject of one of the essays in EndNotes 5 called Error by Rob yeah. Lucas. Not the bird law question, but like this ultimate thing of uh, process versus like concept, the endless debates over, you know, where does capitalism start? The endless debates over, you know, what would the transition process from capitalism be? The endless debates about what the new game we're playing is. So at End Notes 5, Lucas is arguing for like a sort of pluralism about these things because of what a crazy metaphysical conversation that is actually. But it does have to happen at some point and kind of making a nod towards the transformation of quantity into quality or like the tipping point or something. Neither of those things really gets at when is the game different? And it is the same metaphysical problem as the ship of Theseus. Like it is right. it's liter it's like literally a long term problem. And when you have when, when you have two conceptual entities that are in real life, they have a sort of like way of looking at it where it feels like a big old process because it's not like a concept in your head. It's just stuff happening around you, especially yeah. social forms that reproduce themselves. They're very like... I do think there is one thing I feel like at least I can point to. Like the specifics of it, you can really get into the weeds and get too metaphysical. So I do agree that a, some pluralism is necessary. But I think... One thing that I could point to that has to happen for the game to actually change is that however you go about it, the game is meant to empower the capitalist class, specifically. And until they are no longer empowered, you're not going to be able to change the game, really. As long as they hold the ultimate levers of power... It doesn't matter what you do. You you will eventually run into a roadblock in changing the rules to where you're never going to actually change the whole ship using the ship of Theseus metaphor. Yeah, you know one one thing that it's really that this this whole discussion kind of reminds me of is that like kind of like you know like Gramsci's distinction between like an like an active revolution and what he called a passive revolution. Uh, and so like an act to him, like an active revolution was a revolution in which like the actual mode of production was changed. And as such, the class forces that that kind of led the block or whatever or ran that ran the system changed. But like, you know, what he was always, I think, really interested in, I always thought was like the idea of this passive revolution, which is what he thought that like both fascism in the 30s and also like the rise of like Fordism. In, in the United States uh, through the 30s and 40s was like, which was that like, you know, some form of capitalism somewhere goes into crisis and certain actors attempt to reconstitute the system. And the, and the people that have the advantage are always like the, re the, the, re the capitalist class 
because they're like trying to like, they're trying to alter the way capitalism functions in a particular time, but they're not giving up their class power or changing um, the mode of production. And so there's like, there's, there's leeway for reactionary forces and for capitalists like, okay, well, which se segments of labor do we banish from the system, from, from uh, the block or whatever? And, you know, which can we incorporate or like, are there maybe particular factions or fractions of capital are, are more, you know, like finance capital is ascendant under neoliberalism and where manufacturing capital was ascendant under uh, like the post-war kind of Keynesian Fordist era of like North American capitalism. Right. But like if you're actually trying. So it's like that's a much lower bar to clear, like the right populist bar. Right. Is, is so much lower to clear in the present moment than if you are like a leftist who believes that the problem is the game of capitalism. Right. Because like like instit maybe like these little institutional politics can help you in the context of a passive revolution, like reorganizing how capitalism functions. But if your goal is to actually get beyond capitalism, the historical record seems to say that that institutional politics ultimately might undermine you, right? Yeah, so, so that's really like the, the tragic story of institutional politics. When I think of what went wrong with like British feminism, for instance, I think about that there was a sort of like successful, like second wave institutionalization of feminism in Britain, which you know, in, in some ways, it's, it's quite admirable. Like in the U.S., there was the Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution that was shot down. And there's, you know, you know, 40 years, like, humiliation of the women's movement or something. Like, it's like a pretty grim story. But in the U.K., there were some real victories. And, you know, because of further institutional victories of the working class, there was a National Health Service. You know, I mean... Someone else can answer this better than I can, but how's abortion access in the UK? Probably a lot better than it is in the US right now. H however, because of that institutional power block, when there kind of comes like a new, you know, historical wave of like gender freedom that chafes at their interest or something, or that, or that they feel threatened by, they have more power by which to beat it back. So institutional transphobia in the NHS and in, you know, the institutional kind of feminist like layers of the, like the British kind of political class or whatever. See, it just seems to be more powerful. And, and it's like this tragedy of institutional politics of playing the game that you can play. And I think some people would quibble over, you know, is access to abortion, you know, really a capitalist question, you know, let's grant for the sake of argument that it is. It, there is this problem with institutional power and like trying to change the rules of the game or something. Trying to change the rules of the game when the capitalists are in charge is like trying to play a game with like a small child, a game that that child made up. When I was young, my little brother was fascinated with like card games and, and video games that I used to play. And so he tried to make up his own card game. But every time by his own rules, I would start to win. He'd be like, oh no, well, actually you can't do that because if, if you do that, then I get to do this and that totally takes out your monster and so you lose. When you What's change the rules in a way that threaten the interests of the ruling class, they will change, change what the rules are right then and there in order to make sure that they maintain power. And it even goes a step further than that. Because we can't even go back to a kind of Fordist model, right? Which is essentially what people like Bernie Sanders want. That's totally within our history. But now the powers that be are so fucking stubborn that when going back to that kind of Fordist model and doing what Bernie Sanders wants to do fully is probably the thing that would do, be the best to save capitalism right now, which I kind of think it would especially if he could start to mitigate climate change, they won't do it. They'll give him maybe a little bit and make him like the labor department of labor head or whatever. Right. He's, he's got some special thing in the, in the, in the Senate now. Legislative Senate. But it's great. But cool. the thing Good is, job, Bernie, but like, like the thing is it's raw power that decides these things. And Bernie hadn't the power. He didn't have a movement. You know, yeah, it's not it's not like he has like the massive, you know, weight of organized labor, labor or anything behind him. The bosses so, tremble. 
So there's no reason they should ever do it. And if he did get into power, it would be it would like <clears throat> it would you would see the Corbyn uh, phenomena again, where his party will go against him and he would not be able to do anything and there would be nothing done for four years if he won the presidency because well, there isn't power behind him. And the only the, reason FDR was real? able to do it yeah. was because there was power that literally, you know, weren't revolutionary in America. Overwhelmingly, oh. they were just, you know... Well, they them. were up to a point, and FDR was good about diverting that energy and using the Communist Party. FDR used them like a champ. He, he you know, defanged them. He was able to subsume them. Like, that's his historical role. And, you know, that's the... Well, more than, than the revolutionary movement, too, like, it was the Great Depression. You want to know why FDR got 80% of the vote? I would bet money. It's because Hoover, the president before him, fucked up so bad during the early days of the Great Depression. He was a Republican. And he refused to do <laughs> fucking shit yeah. about the Depression. Yeah, he he had a pretty Malthusian approach to the Depression. Yeah. Well, he was, um, he was the phrase well Hoover camps, out. right? It was just... Yeah, they used to call they used to call the fucking slum towns that b- were built up during the early Great Depression Hoovervilles, yeah. uh, named after the president because he was he wasn't even Malthusian. He wasn't, wasn't even that his... smart. He was just a believer in laissez-faire capitalism, and so right. he didn't do anything to intervene. Was it Andrew Mellon was his Treasury Secretary, and his his policy was liquidate, liquidate, liquidate. I think was the famous quote. Wow, let, let everything go to shit. You know, let them everything fire burn, and then you know, from a Marxist point of view, you'll you, you'll resuscitate stuff, right? But to, to the extent that it was so big, it just basically put the system itself into doubt. Well, right. So, like, mm-hmm. I, I guess to bring bring it back, like, there wasn't necessarily even like there was a a, a much larger workers' movement in America at the time that was pretty powerful, especially compared to now. The big thing that changed wasn't the, the threat of revolution, but there has to be some kind of shock to the system. Similar to how in World War One, the Bolsheviks or any of the, the Russian communist socialist parties wouldn't have really been successful if it wasn't for World War One. So there's a point here, multiple that I like, and I'm I kind of think it's a deep point, and I'm not exactly sure what to make of it, but it strikes me as being very deep, which is that multiple games are being played simultaneously, often with inconsistent mm-hmm. rules. Does anybody have anything to say about that line? Because I, I feel like there's something kind of profound being said there that I'm not really yeah. grasping. So, like, when I, when I was saying before, arguably, you know, for the, for the sake of argument, that uh, birth control is a central part of capitalism, some people would really, you know, disagree with that. And, you know, some days I'm like, is it really, you know, like, are these things really part of the same? Because, you know, let's say patriarchy, much older than capitalism, right? And in some ways, a much more like fundamental question that divides an internal group and, you know, differentiates within a population necessarily, no matter, like, almost no matter what kind of population it is. Like, as long as, as it's natalist, you know, it's like birthing like children in the natural, you know, animalistic way, you know, then it has this, you know, internal differentiation, right? And so arguably the logic of patriarchy is much older and maybe some of the rules of the game have changed in patriarchy or something, but they're ultimately, there's still like a systemic logic at work. For somebody like Eric Olin Wright, he is very much a, it, what Marxist feminists would call like a, a two systems theorist. Like he doesn't see patriarchy as having a necessary connection with capitalism. So I think that might even explicitly be what he's thinking about here because he wrote about feminism as a, as a parallel theory of social reproduction and emancipation. And thinking about the logic of patriarchy and the logic of capitalism as different, but potentially coupled is, you know, that's that's pretty cool and profound thought. Like, even if, all right, so even if you don't take patriarchy as a necessary part of capitalism, you know, let's say it might not be, access to birth control will have uh, an impact on national population, which has an impact on the labor market. And like like the bourgeoisie of a certain period and their political representatives might take up national population policy as something very important to their interests as, you know, a state managing, you know, their ethnic population and you know, doing what states do, the grotesque, like, you know, ethnic population, like kind of leading, <laughs> you 
you know, and, and also, um, you know, cultivating different kinds of labor markets. This sounds a bit conspiratorial, but these things were matters of national policy for all of the big 19, you know, like all of the, all of the big modernist regimes had integrated sort of nationalist family thought like this. And there's, you know, a, a genuine sort of conflict between types of capitalist actor about how to navigate times where, you know, birth control could be readily available to everyone in the same way everyone could be fed. Like it could be part of just a minimum program just for being alive if you distributed all the wealth in a real nice, even way. So yeah, that's an extrapolation of how loosely coupled systems or tightly coupled systems or whatever, like different kind of systemic games can be being played at the same time or, or even come into conflict. No, I think it's a really interesting way for us to think about it as well as all, as well as society as a process, you know, that the cultural and superstructural stuff might be uh, uh, lagging or ahead of, say, economic uh, or overlapping over the economic systems, you know, the mode of production that you have these inconsistencies of different different stuff happening at the same time. It's an interesting way to think about it. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that Wright has, you know, a sort of general kind of analogization between like different forms of like, like emancipatory social science and emancipatory social theory that it's a pretty interesting framework. I know it's all situated in this like reformist, like analytical Marxist shit, but it's like pretty decent thinking, like, I don't know, sort of like a unique combination of positions. Well, it seems like, he leaves in the opportunity for like a more revolu- pro-revolutionary take on it mm-hmm. that he kind of adds at the la- end of that slot last slide, like, you know, oh, we could have evolved it into where it's just a different game. But earlier, ch- just changing the game itself was still part of the equation. And so you could just kind of ignore that last bit and it's better off for it. Well, his writing does come off as as someone who, at least, it was my first experience with Wright, but like who's fairly generous, it seems, to the pe- to, to the people he's engaging with critically. You know, like like there's a part of like sometimes it feels like he's like always oh, like he's like he's like the world's friendliest disc rapper. <laughs> you know, like, it's yeah. like like he's not Wisconsin, or he lived R.I.P. in Wisconsin. Oh, so he's, you know. He's also, he's like chill. the world's the world's least successful disc rapper. <laughs> yeah, because just, just rappers don't don't make uh, don't make money from being kind to their opponents, right? Yeah, That's they don't take a works, virtue centric so. approach. To <laughs> <laughs> no. Let's do our macro our micro analysis of the of the rapper game here. Oh, I've got a slide here for us all. This is from the Wikipedia on bird law. Apparently, <laughs> there's an animal law. Beautiful laws regarding animals in ger- general. Yeah. Uh, or the bird migra- uh, the migratory bird treaty act of 1918 or the birds directive of the European Union and an area of law in the American television show it's always sunny in Philadelphia <laughs> <laughs> yeah guess, guess which sense we're very interested in at the moment i'm not sure yeah animal law clearly Animal law. It is entirely the well-being of birds that we are <laughs> motivated by. Not it's, some, it's well, a cheap re- cheap it, to a sitcom. Yeah. Now that you say it out loud, it's starting to be true. Esri, do you want to take laws this? Affect birds. Yes. Okay. Take this light. All right. Before I have a religious awakening, the class analysis of games, rules, and moves. The final column of this table proposes a connection between Marxist, Weberian, and Durkheimian currents of class analysis in game and society as game metaphor. First, let's deal with the Marxist approach. Marxist class analysis is anchored in the problem of what game to play, the idea of emancipatory alternatives to capitalism. Fundamental point in analyzing class relations and both the individual practices and collective struggles that are linked to those class relations is to understand the nation of oppression within capitalism and the possibility of an emancipatory systemic alternative. The critique of capitalism in terms of exploitation, domination, and alienation is intimately connected to the Marxian concept of class and the normative vision of a democratic and egalitarian alternative to capitalism 
is grounded in an account of the transformation of those class relations. Sometimes Marxist class analysis is elaborated in terms of a grand narrative about how the internal dynamics and contradictions of capitalism set in motion a dynamic that both makes the rules unstable and creates a collective agent capable of challenging the game itself. Other times, the idea of an alternative is framed more modestly as an imminent possibility with a much more open-ended understanding of the collective agents that might strive to realize the alternative. You have, you have a note here about um, uh, normativity in this, which is if you're, you know, tuned into the old school Marxist debates or even just what people are slamming each other about on Twitter, the idea that, that communists have norms is usually associated with the reformist right and that are sort of like tipping the hat towards German idealism and Kant or in the Anglo tradition, you know, they might be tipping their hat towards, you know, just I don't know, the Anglo tradition. I mean, come on. But, but I do just kind of think that there is something basic that's true about what motivates Marxists that even like some of the sharpest, most awesome Marxists that really don't want to talk about norms. They don't want to talk about justice and all that, you know, ideological claptrap. They just want to focus on the harms that capitalism causes. I think that's, you know, sort of a rhetorical like position that helps you distance yourself from the way egalitarians normally <laughs> express themselves. You know, I kind of do buy into your your critique of like of it. I just find it interesting that he uses like when you, that he uses the term to deal with Marxist class yeah. analysis as a normative vision while you know I think Marx and a lot of Marxists go out of their way to say it's you know a material process as opposed to a normative vision even yeah, though it's, it's controversial at, to, it, at, at the very least you know right. to Marxists but I think anyone who's not a Marxist and looks at a communist someone whose like whole thinking is motivated by eliminating classes you know <laughs> The whole reason I'm attracted to Marxism yeah, is yeah. for a normative reason. It both well, and everyone and is. It's just rhetorical posturing. And I, I mean, I know yeah. it's, maybe this will get me banned from the hardcore Marxist <laughs> podcast network. Like, come on, man! It's just, it's just posturing. Yeah, I, 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 I think it's important. Any to, of this yeah. shit. <laughs> right? Like th that was plausible in like the 20s or something when like you still had such a mechanistic reading of like Capital Volume 1 or something like like that that you could just hope it like you didn't have to pretend to care about norms because the the, the you know the the just me the mech uh, mechanics of his of historical progress were just going to turn out in your favor. But we all know that's not fucking true and we've all known it's not true for 80 years. So if someone still wants to just kind of goof around like I, I'm sorry, I'm not in the same space you guys are in, so I, so I don't. I'm not going to pretend that I care. No, about no, it. No, 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 no. You know, it's like I, no. I, I'm, 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 I'm being, I'm being very charitable. I, I just, I, I just want to respond to Tom because Tom's right. Yeah. Like a bunch of Marxists would be like, oh, normative. I'm just not normative. It's purely material. I'm just going to rattle off some Aristotle that I don't even know the source of, and you know, like not. Yeah. Like, there's, just, there's all this commentary about the problems of just relying on a uh, like. Those people are nerds who need to get fucked. It was, Okay. You said it's not me. But but there are nerds <laughs> that need to get fucked that are more maybe coherent about this. They end up social Darwinists because when you actually kind of look at nature, it's you don't get communism out of just looking at the way other animals interact, or you know, we don't have any unfiltered access to our, our species being in, in human nature or something. It's it's a really difficult process that's extremely ideologically motivated to, to try to reconstruct what elements of our primate nature are still there and operative or which ones are overcome by our cool Promethean like abilities to reshape ourselves. And th there's, there's, I don't know, like there's infinite complexity there. Some, somewhere the ghost of Kropotkin is like, is like crying a single tear. Well, Kropotkin is awesome because he is, you know, able to like essentially emphasize like those other parts of nature, but like, you know, for a lot of us, the, like the cooperative elements aren't the ones that stand out. When we survey, you know, chill, peaceful nature, it's it's nice, but it's usually the exceptions. The exceptions stick with us. There's something about like human psychology that is like 
you know, painful experiences stand out. They stick with you in a particular way. What's weird about this normative stuff and, you know, material kind of process instead of like people being attracted to, to communism for a normative thing, it's kind of like the the idea that it's just this kind of blind process of history working its way through. It's very teleological and it kind of ironically kind of appeals to somebody's kind of, you know, that, you know, religious kind of nature, you know, where, where normally like that kind of normative stuff is what attracts people to certain kind of religious behavior i think a lot of times too it, it, it plays a kind of a a weird kind of there's a weird function going on where it's like this pure materialism turns out to have a kind of a religious aesthetic for people yeah because i you know i don't think new atheism can survive analytical metaphysics like in, in good faith if you're like a real rational person and you read through not really like the Christian ones. I don't really find those very interesting. Like some of the, the Islamic theology proofs or something. Like where, where they, they feel like that they've like, you know, really grounded themselves in something. I don't know. Like you can see how rational people could disagree. And it's the beginning of real discussions when you can kind of bracket that stuff out. Who wants to take on the Viberian? Sophie, will you take on the Viberian approach? Sure. The class analysis of games, rules, and moves. The Weberian approach. Weberian class analysis is situated especially at the level of the rules of the game. Weber only used the term class to describe inequalities generated through market interactions. For Weberians, capitalism is the only game in town, but its institutions can vary a lot. At stake... And the variation of rules are the ways the markets are organized and regulated and the ways in which players with different market capacities enter into exchange. The big classes of a varying class analysis consist of people who are situated in different ways with respect to the possible capitalist rules of the game, e.g. labor rules, monopoly legislation, rules governing access to education, etc., some of these rules are set by the state, others by firms, and still others by associations. The point of class analysis is to define the relevant categories of people similarly situated with respect to this variability in the rules of the game. Right, there's nothing too controversial in here, is there? I mean, we covered, you know, classes only referring to modern versions of, you know, surplus appropriation, distribution, whatever. I find it wild that you only use the term class to describe inequalities generated through the market interactions. That's pretty wild. It's it's a uh, it's a modern. It's like when you look at everything through the lens of modernity being different than it used to be. Like then you know, I mean it's it's kind of silly because I mean there were markets in the past. Like it's not like there were never markets before. Everything wasn't markets, but there were like pretty. There's some kind of developed mercantile economies in the ancient world. These things did exist. There's a lot of endless debates over what, whether capitalism starts there or not. But I guess from you know Marx's understanding, markets are, are just like, they become special in the capitalist period because that's how everything works. And it, it like kind of takes hold of the society more broadly. And it's, it develops in a, in a way that the ancient mercantile economies don't. For reasons we don't have a satisfying account of. It is wild when you like, I think I was like in some like really kind of, you know, thousand year old Irish church or something and they have, you know, some drawing on the wall and it's like the blue in it is like from fucking Uzbekistan or somewhere, you know, and you're like, yeah. shit, man, there must have been savage trade going on at the time. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's evidence of, you know, kind of a, a broad some kind of broad material network with even some symbolic stuff. Like a lot of fertility symbols appear around the same time, like, like, acro like across the world. Like There's a lot of horny you know. people, a lot of horny people at that time. Well, yeah, yeah, I, I guess so. Like, you know, you could just ascribe transhistorical horniness, which, you know, part, that's part of the <laughs> explanation, yeah. but to be properly marked about it, you know, you, you maybe trans what? some kind of uh, trans transhistorical. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah. yeah, 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 distracted. But, you know, there's, there's also like a, 
there, you know, there's also the possibility that there was some kind of cultural like interest that swept from one point to another. That's just like something that, you know, people weren't really thinking about before. It's a tantalizing thought. Like maybe there were like, there's a lot more, I don't know, maybe there's just so much to history that was lost that we don't have evidence of outside of stuff like, you know, Uzbeki paint in an iron, in like an Irish cave. Yeah, like, I made that. I made that example up, but there is. Like, oh, okay, great. Yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> I was like, is she going to try and you know actually remember what country I said? Yes, <laughs> yes I thought it was true. No, but it's funny. There is shit like that, though. Seriously, there's stuff like no, no, no. Yeah, yes, of course, like there's... certain blues. Well, I don't I think. examples. I, I do think it was like certain blues are in like in the Book of Kells came from like Eastern Turkey or something, you know, okay. and and that's like the seventh century or something like that, you know. Yeah. Like kind of crazy, so it's like Emmanuel Wallace, he always should, like talk about like pre-capitalist carrying trade, right? To like mm -hmm. give give the you know just drive home the idea. It's like yeah, markets are not new, trade is not new. What seems to be new is like the orientation of an of of all social life around those markets and the commodification of all of of all of it, and the idea that ev all the production in society is occurring the vast majority of it for the purpose of of selling on some kind of, of of market right as opposed to like oh yeah like people traded people like if you look at like the kind of like the ideology of like neoclassical economics right it's like like you look at those textbooks you, know, you always talk about like those textbooks right of like of how it's like they need to try to convince people that like i don't know like a first two different indigenous communities and in what eventually became uh, North America were engaged in capitalist production because they traded these one good for another good, right? Which is like, no, that's not. This, there's more to it than that. But because 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 that faction needs to um, naturalize something that people have done for millennia as the same thing as something we've only done for a couple hundred years, depending on your count. Right. Okay. I'm going to take this last one: the Durkheimian approach. So. Durkheimian and class analysis takes both capitalism and its specified institutional rules as given and focuses merely on the moves of the players within the game. This is the world of microclasses and fine-grained occupational differentiation. The interests of professors in research universities are different from those in community colleges. People in these different microclasses develop different identities and make different moves for realizing their own interests. Auto workers, coal miners, truck drivers and oil oil rig workers all operate under different labor market conditions, work in industries facing different kinds of sectoral competition and challenges and have different collective capacities and thus face a different set of possible moves to realize their interests. So long as there is no real prospect of challenging the rules, the general rules of the game, their interests remain largely distinct and fragmented most of the time. Okay, I think we've kind of gone through that shite already. Is there any, anything here Somebody, anybody wants to say? Let's move it on. Okay, Bob, do you want to take this slide here? We're motoring through. We only have about two or three slides left. Sure thing. All right, so yes, class analysis of games, rules, and moves. So scholars in the various traditions do sometimes venture out of their home territory. Marxist class analysis are also is also deeply engaged in understanding struggles within capitalism that don't call the game into question. Uh, they often invoke characteristics such as market position, employment relations, skills, and so on, that have a distinctly Weberian provenance, occupational and sectoral specificities and solidarities that have a more Durkheimian character are also frequently used. The use of Marxist class analysis has died out since the 1960s, especially with the rise of neoliberalism. Uh, the politics of uh, Tina, there is no alternative and the collapse of command and control Soviet communism. This had subsequently led to the rise of varieties of capitalism uh, discussion within political economy and economic sociology. So I'm reminded of kind of like the regulationist uh, school here. Class analysis is used to distinguish between neocorporatism in Northern Europe, disorganized capitalism of the Anglosphere, and so on. All of this presupposes the existence of capitalism. In the 2010s, after the globalization and financialization of capitalist economies, with the general victory of neoliberal views, there is much less emphasis on such variation. T 
Argentina has spread from capitalism versus socialism to variation in the rules of capitalism itself. And, you know, there's a little comment here. What about China? Right. You yeah, know, that, that, that switches China? it up. Like, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Varieties of capitalism. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, yeah. literally, like, it, it, like, I don't think Chinese China is neoliberal. Yeah, it's a variety. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's it a has its own model. variety of capitalism. Yeah. It has its own it's, model. I'm just saying like, yeah. the, 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 the debate around just neoliberalism is the only game in town is, oh, is okay. not exactly true. Like the, one of the biggest economy, the biggest economy in the world at this yes, stage no, right. is, is operating on a different variant of capitalism. It, yeah. And, and, and maybe yeah. this is the place where you, maybe it's just the timing of when this is written, like even, even six years ago, maybe things feel a little bit different, but, but uh, you almost wonder if right himself is is um kind of is kind of embedded in this kind of end of history ideological moment oh 110 percent. this guy's yeah. like a, uh, was like a new left probably maoist i'm just you know guessing from the time period his early work is um kind of like sort of post althusserian and focuses on like prisons and stuff and oh. like value, and value theory and like so yeah he's you know i'm i this is why I have patience for, for, you know, the, the reformist stuff is this guy is like one of those new left revolutionaries that held on to Marxism and tried to develop it as best as he could throughout his life. Even once the revolutionary horizon he was hoping for had very much receded. Which is, that's great context to know, right? Because, and sometimes I feel like these, these kind of sectoral debates become very like, I, ironically, uh, given what we were just discussing and what I was just kind of ranting about, very uh, normative and moralistic, as opposed to yes. thinking through like thinking through like, right. well, why why did this person, why did this group of people seem to uh, come to a particular set of understandings? I mean, like it's 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 not it isn't just some idealistic thing. There's usually because, some basis to it because they're turncoats. They're because they're, yeah, because they're, that's them. the only reason, you know. Like, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, they, no, yeah they, no, that that's it's it is valuable, and it, but it also gives you even like even more respect for you know the I don't know. Paul Maddock Jr. or something, whose dad was like a council communist, like a anti-Bolshevik communist, gets invested, investigated by the FBI and is flattered. He's like, oh, finally, you guys notice, huh? Like, <laughs> and, and so he's just like carrying the like anti-Bolshevik communist, like American like flame in the 90s or some shit. You know what I mean? And he's like, not doing it. Well, yeah, 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 but like now it's now it's cool. You can write for the Brooklyn Rail and shit and whatever, but like he know, was but, doing it when it was on There the motherfuckers I respect. There the time. There the motherfuckers I respect. He was like, he was why like am on, I doing on this? On another he must have felt like he was on another planet. Yeah. He must have felt mm. like he was in a parallel dimension uh, cuz I, I remember, you know, the the 2000s version of that. You know? Like I remember starting to, you know, kind of my red switch was starting to flip on, you know, I start, and, and it was, it did feel like it was from another dimension. So just imagining that to the nth degree. Yeah. Like, what? And there's well, places you know in the world that are so different than where right went. I think it's kind of mm -hmm. almost one of the things is what you're sort of getting at where it's like, that you know, cause you could go the, 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 the opposite of that would be like going full Miliband, right? Like it was <laughs> like, what, what, what was, what was like, I love that joke about Miliband and regardless of your opinion of him as a theorist, I love the joke. That's like, Oh, uh, Ralph Miliband, you know, great theorist, terrible parent. <laughs> but here, here's something I'll say. I'll say Azri, like you're right. was a Maoist. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Like uh, the purely, I've purely guessed this from his, you know, he was at the very least sympathetic to the post Maoist like wave of like, you know, the Panthers and stuff like that. Like a lot of the new left was. Right. I'm, and I'm, I'm just inferring this purely based on like the guy studied prisons like, and value theory. <laughs> I think that, I think the journey from like a, being a, a, a Maoist or Leninist to reformism is not that giant a step. No, you know, no. Sure. I think it's, it's easier for like some council communists to stay true <laughs> to their vision. Perhaps. I don't know. Maybe we're talking bullshit. Maybe I'll edit all this bullshit out. No, I mean, yeah. you know, I, I think Paul Maddox Jr. probably was helped by, like, council communism being a little bit closer to anarchism, and anarchism was, kind of took over as a predominant form of left-wing thought, at least in the United States. Right. Because, you know, it could be edgy and postmodern and, you know, d d never really gave a fuck about the Soviet Union. Yeah, so, like, in some way, you couldn't possibly mean communism like that. Right. That failure. You couldn't mean that. And you could say, of course not. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> yes. Whereas even post Malice, they had a little bit of a, they had some love for, you know, Malice China. And yeah. And part the, of it was not knowing what was really happening there. Yeah. The but, mythos of the cultural revolution. It's very, right. And, and like, it's very similar to the, the mythos of the, the Soviet as the, as the perfect democratic form. And, you know, I don't know if you get like, if you get whipped by one of those fantasies and not the other, it is kind of sus if you're only whipped by the, you know, the Russian one. <laughs> like, you, you have to kind of understand where, like, there's this this big ideological international impact that is just distinct from whatever actually happens. Like, whatever potentials were actually in the equation. Those things, like, have big resonances among, like, some of the most interesting thinkers. And thinkers that are often providing ammunition for, like, why what went wrong in those revolutions is so bad or odious or, you know, whatever. But it's, it's just a pattern you see over and over. Events of world stark importance, regardless of the truth on the ground. Like, you know, they energize intelligent, conscientious people. Bob, do you want to take that last sentence then, the last point? Sure thing. The death of class analysis embedded in the rules of the game is proclaimed. All, he's talking about this kind of ended history moment. All that is left is class-oriented moves within the system. This makes the grusky whedon neo durkheimian model of micro-class analysis uniquely positioned for the era of triumphant neoliberalism. I had the rap this track just got a little got a little harder, actually, um, with that. <laughs> now, now we're full on into into uh, Jay Z Nas territory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is beyond oh, my oh. purview. Yeah, but we're we're still we're still not arguing over the rules of you know over the what game is being played, which is the pocket big territory. Like, That's right. I'm still stuck in like the Sun Ra versus like fucking Miles Davis groove. So uh, come was, back to me in about sixty years. Was that a real? Was no, there a rivalry there. I don't know. I just made it up. Uh, but, uh, yeah. I wish there was. I want to. I want to hear some like jazzy diss tracks. Are you fucking kidding me? I don't know. I hope. I hope they chilled. I hope they smoked weed. I'm sure did heroin. Uh, although the Sun Ra was teetotal, no drinking, no smoking. He was like very hardcore. Oh, he was one of that them. is very counterintuitive. Yeah, and he would literally ban all his band from like drinking or smoking, and like he'd catch them like you know smoking weed, and like they get kicked out and shit. Holy shit! That's wow. like that's like someone telling me that like Parliament Funkadelic were teetotalers. I'm like that doesn't make yeah, any. That's sense. That's definitely not the case. <laughs> no, it's yeah. not. I went to Sun Ra's band extra there about a month ago. His his lead saxophone player is still playing. He was 98 on oh, stage. Wow. He's, it was like really good, although he was a bit kind of a bit out of the, out of it a couple of times, but uh, it was still pretty fucking cool. Esri, do you want to take this final slide because it's it's what EO, EO writes summing up of the stuff. So no better person than to take to give us. <laughs> can, can you do an EO write impersonation? I don't, I can't really like call to mind what he sounds like right now. I'd say probably be a new, he strikes me as in like having a, an accent like Norman Finkenstein. Now, I okay, don't know so if that's true or not. Jewish. All right. Well, like, you know, like a Brooklyn kind of a Jewish accent, I'm thinking, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, every so often it slips out anyway. So, okay. um, the class analysis of games, rules, and moves. For Eric Olin Wright, it is a mistake to treat the relevance of different levels of class analysis as simply a question of which type of class concept is most important in empirically explaining variations in some outcome across individuals. Even in this time of the apparent disillusion of the big classes, there are times in which the rules of the game do become hotly contested, and these classes reemerge rapidly on the political scene. Like in Wisconsin, in 2011, when the Republican governor passed an anti-union law, or it might have been an executive order. Don't recall. Look it up. Scott Walker was that guy's name. The many microclasses embedded in state employment suddenly congealed as a big class. The commonality of interests with respect to the rules of the game became more salient than the differentiated interests. Individuals live their lives in class structures that shape their interests and subjectivity, not only over what strategies are immediately optimal for securing their economic interests, but also over the rules of the game and the game itself. What we need is a class analysis that moves across these levels of analysis and explores their interconnections. Yeah, 
this is um, actually sort of like a long-term achievement of something from the old Althusserian like research program is this idea of different levels of description and being able to talk about different levels of causality. At first, this was probably sort of a causal shell game part of Althusserians because they were always fond of saying in the last instance, in the last instance, in the last instance, it's always, always determined by the mode of production or the, the economy or, you know, whatever. But it's, it's still fundamentally the case that in social science more broadly, there is this notion of like multi-level kind of selection happening in games like across a society that it is partially influenced by this Althusserian paradigm. There's no doubt about it, but there's actually, it's, it's, I think more true that the subject matter is sufficiently complex that it calls for it. And different generations of theorists will kind of encode this complexity in different ways. So, you know, I'm not giving the Althusserians their, their ultimate uh, respect, but in the case of right, it's, it's obvious that this is, you know, part of the resonance going on here of being able to play different levels of the game is that you can preserve some of the like ultimate Marxist class causality in the last instance, in the final determination and so on. Like that kind of, that, you know, you, that agenda is still being fulfilled here. <laughs> and, and so like, yeah, I don't know. Like whatever I think whatever you can get from that kind of like fetishized layer of like theory history, I think you can get better from, you know, people like this. I really do. Like I think I think they fulfill some kind of scientific dream or whatever that a bunch of, you know, people that have this really bong rip wizard, you know, way of expressing themselves and that people become specialists about, <laughs> they can't do this as well. They don't have this like robust and understanding of, I don't know, anything to articulate it to this degree of specificity. <laughs> Maybe I'm being t- too harsh or deflationary, but like. Well, yeah. well, your first mistake was saying that they're people, they're frogs. No, please. Like pe- people need to get out of their theory bubbles and like engage with like social science. Did you say frauds are frogs? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Distinction without a difference. There's one more important point, though, I think that we haven't really dealt with. It was a point in the chat from Mason earlier. You said that birds that... aren't real. Um, you know what? <laughs> you know what? Real. I'm glad you said it. Someone <laughs> well, needs to say it. Yeah, it's just, it's, just, everyone, it's just a scam made up by Big Bird Law. It, right. Well, it's not just, it goes deeper than Big Bird Law, Bob. Oh you have God. to understand, Bird Law itself is a front for the shadowy figures in the government who killed all the birds in the 1960s and replaced them with drones that are there to surveil us. People out there who are sprinkling, old, gentle old men, sprinkling bird seeds, feeding the birds, feeding bread to the ducks. Really what they're doing is they're recharging the batteries of the bird drones. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and, and here is, this, is this the actual birds aren't real conspiracy? Because yeah. I'm uh, wow. Well, There's it's so like much fake, more about the world I need to learn. What? It's a fake conspiracy. That <laughs> no, I know, like the guy's trolling, right? Yeah, it's trolling. Yeah, the guy. Yeah. It's like an elaborate troll. Yeah, yeah. But like any time that happens, I don't know. And here I'm just sitting here thinking the need for us to posit the birds is to make up for the absence of God and the absence of our parents who watch over us. You see, like, I don't know. Some if birds weren't real. Uh, the deep state would have to invent it then. Yes, or the, yeah. the deep conscious fantasy, a deep and the unconscious ideological <laughs> fantasy, which is exactly the same thing as your inborn human nature. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I think your your problem is you take psychoanalysis a little bit too seriously. 